G'day, thanks for joining me. On this ride we're going to do Paddy's Flat Road. This is a very popular ride amongst riders from South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales. And through the winter months, it's quite a tame ride. With a difficulty level of almost zero, all you've really got to watch out for on Paddy's Flat Road itself is oncoming traffic and maybe the odd kangaroo. However, throughout the subtropical summer months, things can get a little gnarly and old Paddy's can throw up some pretty interesting surprises. Surprisingly even to me, there's a lot of history surrounding this road and the whole area from Woodenbong down to Tabulam. Tabulam itself is steeped in history that's amazing. So grab yourself a coldie, kick back and I'll tell you all about it. The tribes of the Bundjalung people who occupied the lands of South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales for tens of thousands of years were onto a pretty good thing. With a fantastic subtropical climate, these lands had an abundance of everything. But in the late 1700s, this happened. And lands like that were exactly what the European settlers were after. Red cedar soon became one of Australia's greatest exports, but by the 1790s, it had already become very obvious to authorities that the red cedar was going to run out, so they moved further afield, which spawned towns like this, Woodenbong. Now let's get the name out of the road before we go any further. Originally called William Town, after the first family that settled in the area, but the town was eventually christened Woodenbong, which was derived from an Aboriginal word. Now there's a little conjecture surrounding two different Aboriginal words that the name may have been derived from, but I can tell you this much. It had nothing to do with this guy. Him and his artistic flair come much later. Since day one, even before the woodcutters turned up, Woodenbong has been synonymous with beautiful cattle. And still is to this day. The town sports a nice little cafe which is pretty popular amongst riders. And there's a couple of service stations, which I suggest you make use of if you're going down Paddy's Flat. Because if you're anything like me, the old adventurous spirit will take over long before you get to the end of Paddy's. And fuel's pretty hard to come by down there. I'm using Clarence Way here to get down to Urbanville. But if you prefer to get straight into the dirt, I'd suggest you go out to the east a little bit and use Emu Creek Road. But if you're not sooky about slimy green causeways, go out to the west of Woodenbong a bit come down Brewery Creek Road. It's a fantastic ride. Both routes are all dirt and they'll both bring you out pretty close to Urbanville. Urbanville is nestled in the afternoon shadow of what's known on the map as North Obelisk. Hmm. Bit of a stretch. Anyway, locally it's known as Crown Mountain. Urbanville and Woodenbong are only 12 kilometres apart and they both started out as cattle stations in the early 1800s. Extreme isolation and very hostile natives made life very difficult. Urbanville was known as Tulum back then, a name that was derived from the Aboriginal word for lice. In the 1850s a couple of guys were making their way from Drake to what's now known as Ipswich. While camped on a creek bed they stumbled across this stuff. Instantly, what was nothing more than a settlement on a cattle station grew into a massive circus which contained nearly 18,000 people at its peak. Before long, the first white baby was born on the gold fields, William Urban. And you guessed it, that's where the name Urbanville came from. After the short-lived gold rush, the town went through a few stages of relying on the timber industry, beef cattle and dairy cattle, which supported a nice new butter factory. To get to Paddy's Flat Road from here, simply head southwest on Tulum Road. Or if you've come down Brewery Creek Road, just turn right when you hit Tulum Road. A couple of kilometres down the road on your left, you'll find the road to Tulum Falls. Now the Githable people of the Bundjalung tribe were very suspicious of the falls and told their children that they were full of Tulum, which is their word for lice, in order to keep them away from the falls. Just down here on the right, I'll point out where Brewery Creek Road comes out. Here it is here. 
So we're now only a couple of kilometres away from the top of Paddy's Flat Road. We're also now in what is actually still called the area of Tulum. Now probably like most of you, I don't know how many times that I've done this ride and not even given a thought to its historical significance. Then late last year I started thinking to myself, why does Paddy's Flat Road exist? What's it here for? And how long has it been here? Well, didn't that open a can of worms? The road pretty much follows a route used by the people that lived in the Tabulam and Drake areas since around the 1840s. The first few kilometres have been bitumen for quite a long time. Another couple of kilometres of crappy two-coat seal have just been added to the bitumen, but it ends at Tin Hut Road here. If you want to go up Tin Hut Road, it's a dead end, or it actually leads into a state forest. But if you want to chill out for a while, there's an absolutely beautiful viewpoint up there. As we hit the gravel, I'll have to tell you that after talking to some of the locals, they totally get why we come down here. What they don't understand is that 90% of the Care Flight Choppers trips down here are head-ons or head-on related. Case in point. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. The first sign of anything civilised after you've hit the dirt is this beautiful white house. Now I've no doubt that most people ride past this house and think, hmm, nice house, and that's about it. But most don't realise, this is the old Tulum pub. Built in the 1880s by a guy called Big John Payne, the pub has been lovingly restored by the last couple of owners. The current owners were nice enough to take me through the house and have a bit of a look around. And the detail and attention to its historical past was amazing. Big John passed away in 1910 and his wife Mary continued running the pub until the 1930s. Big John's buried a couple of hundred metres back up the road under a fairly elaborate monument. So why a pub out here you ask? Well, quite simply, this was the epicentre of the gold rush. And with two and a half thousand thirsty miners in the immediate area, who wouldn't start a pub? There was even an annual race day that was held opposite the pub, just on the other side of Tulum Creek. Imagine the goings on when a couple of thousand miners turned up for that. This whole area is still to this day peppered with mine shafts. Just down the bottom of the hill here, about halfway between the pub and when you cross Tulum Creek, is Billy May's Point. I'm told by locals that this small patch of land that backs down to Tulum Creek was a bustling village providing miners with shops and even a hospital. And there's even a cemetery down there somewhere. It's privately owned now and barely has anything to show for those boom times. A couple of hundred metres down from Billy Mays, you'll cross Tulum Creek. If you look down to the left as you cross the bridge, you'll see the original crossing. As you ride along the plateau on the western edge of Yabra National Park, the road thins out a bit. As you can see, nice shiny clay, and that's a bit detrimental when the first rains come, but it's still quite passable through the wet season. The descent from the plateau down into the Clarence River Valley has usually got quite good traction, but if you are here in the wet season, don't be fooled. There's every chance that you're about to turn around and go home. On this occasion, a couple of wet seasons ago, we were very lucky to get through, and if you look up above Andrew on his 1290 here, that river sand had been washed up there a couple of days earlier, and the river had actually been a couple of metres higher than that again. Old Clarence can get a bit angry on occasion. Now, time to make reference to the only bit of history that anybody seems to know about down here. The tank traps. In order to get through that, I'm gonna to have to revisit the Brisbane line, which I spoke about in my first video. The Brisbane line was a line of defenses from Brisbane to Tenterfield. Not Adelaide, not Perth, just Tenterfield. So the Australian military hierarchy, being what they were early in World War II, decided that the Japanese might come down Paddy's Flat Road. And these little concrete pyramids were going to stop them in their tracks. 
but at the time of their construction in 1942, the only Australians that had ever experienced a full frontal attack from the Japanese were the 2nd 30th in Malaya and the Chocos or National Guard in New Guinea. If any of these guys were consulted before the construction of these pyramids, I'm pretty sure the reply would have been something like, don't waste the concrete. You see, the Japanese were nearly more inclined to use bicycles than tanks, and they did a type of blitzkrieg, just like the Germans. But instead of tanks and stukas, they just used people. Waves and waves of people. So yeah, to me, the tank traps stand as a monument to Australia's naivety at the start of World War II. And if you'd like to know more about the controversial Brisbane line, refer to my first video on the Brisbane Valley. Literally just around the corner from the tank traps are the graves of Christopher and Mary Mealing. And there's another grave in between theirs, which is a really rough cast concrete stone. I can't make it out, but. So Christopher and Mary were buried here in the late 1890s. And apart from the fact that there was a Christopher Mealing from Tabulam that was in the Boer War in the Light Horse Brigade, I can't find out much more about them. So if you know anything, hit us up in the comments. The climb up out of the valley is pretty much the same sort of gradient as when you came down into the valley. For some reason, the road surface is much better on the southern side though. The climb is rewarded at the top by some really nice viewpoints, but it's quite difficult to get off the road and park up to have a look. The bitumen starts again around Pretty Gully, which is another area synonymous with gold mining in the late 1800s. A bit like Billy May's point, you'd really have to go bush to find anything of any historical value around here though. There is apparently a lot of mine shafts around here as well, and there are water races or water channels which we use to shift water around the gold fields, and that was used in the process of removing the ore from the gold. There's nearly always a story around the names of places in these old gold fields, but not Pretty Gully. It was called Pretty Gully because well, it's pretty. There's new bitumen all the way out to the Bruxner Highway now, and they've done it out of this cheap-ass two-coat seal, and they've left loose five mil gravel all over it. So you might want to take that into consideration before you start getting too excited. Now you have a couple of options between here and Tabulam. You can try Hooton's Road to the east. Rumour is the bridge has been replaced and you can actually get into Benalbo, but I can't say for certain whether there's any truth in that. The other option being Sugarbag Road to the west, which will take you into Drake. But it can get a bit dodgy in the wet, and it is quite an adventurous ride sometime. Now as we approach the end of Paddy's Flat Road and turn left onto the Bruxner Highway to coast into Tabulam, I'll start my story about the town. In 1840, 23 year old Scotsman Peter Pagan and his brother-in-law William Evans were the first white people to claim any land out here. The pair built a shack, and started farming sheep. In April 1841, from about 200 metres away, Pagan noticed some Aborigines enter his shack. He shot at the natives unsuccessfully and then tried to pursue them on foot. Later that day, Pagan's body was found on the banks of the Clarence River. Now the ensuing crimes that were committed in the name of reprisal were absolutely horrendous. To cut a very long story short, over the best part of the next two decades, Aboriginal camps were razed to the ground, their children were stolen, and many innocent tribesmen were simply shot dead. One relatively tiny story in a very dark chapter of Australia's history. Oddly, in the midst of these reprisals, one white family was getting on famously with the Wallable people of the Tabulam area. They even employed them on their brand new station. And turns out, that the family owe a hell of a lot to these guys because they taught this guy how to ride a horse really well. A little bit of a prerequisite if you want to become the first ever leader of the Light Horse Brigade and consequently the first ever general in Australia. Henry George Chevelle was born here in Tabulam in 1865, always known as Harry, presumably after his childhood mentor King Harry Mundine of the Wallabal tribe. On a side note, all the Chevelle siblings were all fluent in Wallable. Harry's exploits in military history are seemingly endless. Leading the first ever contingent of mounted infantry to leave Australia, he was much loved by his troops. 
When World War I broke out, Harry could often be seen in the trenches in Gallipoli, one of very few lieutenant generals that ever bothered to go and see how their troops were going first hand. In 1917, Harry orchestrated one of history's last ever cavalry attacks at Beersheba, passing away just before his 80th birthday in 1945. General Sir Henry George Chevelle left a lasting legacy in Australia's military history. There's quite a good monument here in Tabulam to the Mounted Infantry and the Light Horse Brigade, who had quite a big camp here even before Harry went to school. And that leads me to this debacle. The demolition of the old Tabulam Bridge. Now let me break this down for you. Completed in 1903 by a coalition between Australia's favourite fighting sons, the Light Horse Brigade, and local Aboriginals. This was the longest spanning timber bridge in the Southern Hemisphere, and it was still structurally sound. Now, I totally understand its replacement, but its demolition? That is beyond me. That bridge had survived literally horrendous flood after horrendous flood, and it was still structurally fine. Okay, it was past motor traffic, couldn't it have been left for generations to come representing the people that built it? It was very significant. Old members of the Light Horse and Tabulam locals were absolutely devastated by this. Okay, well that's it for now. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to do a bit of this and a bit of that. Catch you next time. All my riding gear and accessories are from Shark Leathers on the Gold Coast. And I use Adventure First Simpson panniers because they're tough as.